information about people, the nation state to have information about people is to be able to exercise control. Uh, and in this intersection of information, privacy and technology, these intersections are sometimes visible, mostly invisible. Uh, we have to work out how best uh, to secure everyone's, everyone's privacy. Uh, one second. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so there are, um, there's a rapid deployment of technologies, uh, privacy destroying technologies that are used every day uh, to collect uh, information. And uh, so things like routine uh, collection of transactional data, uh, automated surveillance, facial recognition software, internet tracking, click trails, cookies, uh, you know, traffic lights, uh, cameras, every day, your phones, your laptops, uh, compromise privacy on a daily basis and further and expand the corpus of information that we have. And um, uh, the forces that seek to collect this information are large, well organized, very well resourced. And this can often, this is and can often be a, a direct assault on the democratic project. It's a reinterpretation of what it means to be free. If someone knows about you or has, through a collection of information, whether overt or covert, subversive or otherwise, has a profile of you. And uh, standing against these forces are people like Jake. Uh, I've been told not to describe certain parts of his, of his profile, and I'm sure all of you already know what he's done. Uh, Jake was a co-member of the Tor project. Uh, he was the first employee, if I'm not mistaken, and I believe he'll be talking about that later today. Um, he also advised, uh, as I found out a couple of days ago, the government of Ecuador on how to conduct their elections, specifically how to use electronic voting machines in a manner that best secures privacy and ensures public transparency in the, in the democratic process. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jake, who will speak for about 20, 25 minutes, after which we'll have questions. I have a couple of requests, not requests, I have to say a couple of things. Please switch off your phones. Uh, if you're going to take cam uh, photographs, try not to you know, flash people's eyes. Um, and lastly, are we online? Great. Uh, we're online, so the live stream is working. And also, when you have questions after 20 minutes, wait for someone to give you a mic so that your comments are recorded. Thank you. So I think, can you hear me now without me having to have this microphone? You can just pass it into the audience. So I'm a little sniffly, sorry. I, uh, I'm really quite honored to be here. And uh, so, I mean, first I feel like I should say thank you, you know? And uh, I'll walk out here slowly. But uh, um, you know, I wanted to say thank you for having me here, because it's quite an honor. I've been to India a number of times. Actually, every time I come to India, I come to Bangalore. And um, it's really quite an honor. And some of the people here really inspire me, especially the free software community and the people from CIS, people like Maria, for example, and um, some of the other people who aren't here, unfortunately. Um, but if you have some questions and you want to interrupt me, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, I'm a really big fan of anarchism, so you should participate. Um, and by a big fan, what I really mean is that uh, I'm a philosophical anarchist. So while I like the idea of liberal democracy, uh, it doesn't seem to be working out very well. So I'd like to talk about utopia. And um, I think if you're not a utopianist, you're kind of a schmuck. And so we should try to shoot for the moon and land in the clouds, I think is the phrase. Um, so, you know, I guess I sort of have a little bit of a dark view of what the current world looks like. And that, in theory, when the Berlin Wall fell, um, you know, the world's history ended and we just had one superpower and everything was hunky-dory and there were no problems, right? It sounds familiar. It's the sort of new conservative American view of the world. Well, so that's obviously bullshit. Um, but, you know, you won't hear that from very many people. And in fact, we live in a world now where, for example, last week at the Oslo Freedom Forum, I found a, a some targeted malware on an Angolan activist computer. And this targeted malware appears to have at least been code signed um, by someone certified by Apple as a developer. And it appears that the person is on LinkedIn, though I don't know for sure if this is really them, but they appear to work with an Indian um, cyber war research group in a university. 
And I'm happy to like share this information with anyone if they want to verify it or help me to understand it better. But it seems quite strange that the Angolan government, which is known for some very serious human rights abuses, that they would, for example, have their dissidents targeted by an Indian consultant of sorts. That's kind of like the modern mercenary, right? So making South Africa look re reputable again, I guess, you know, by taking the mercenary out of, the, uh, out of that uh, previous reputation and sort of moving it online. This, this kind of thing, though, it sounds very rare, but it seems to be the case that it happens all over the place. And so I could talk to you about Tor, or I could talk to you a little bit about anonymity on the internet, but I sort of think it's more important to talk about things that aren't technological, because technology is actually quite boring when we compare it with the richness of society. And if you object to this and you want to hear me talk about Tor, now's the time to speak up. So, I mean, do you mind if I sort of opine a little bit about philosophy and how this technology impacts our world instead of giving you a tutorial in Tor? Is that fine? Yes. Oh. Okay, so, I mean, when, when I think about the Indian context, I'm particularly horrified by this idea of the central monitoring system and the mass identification of all people. Right? So if we look at history, what we see is that the mass identification of people, as well as understanding details about them, their religion, their location, their sex, their sexual preference, their family structure, things like that, we see that in history, especially in the 20th century, that this information is used to exterminate people. This is a really concerning thing, and every single time it has happened, everyone has said, oh, that will never happen, or it could not happen. And for example, there was a company by the name of Deutsche Homag, which is a subsidiary of another company we're all familiar with, which is called IBM. Are you familiar with this story? Is anyone here not familiar with this story? Okay, well, I'm going to ruin your night. So the Germans are well known for being quite efficient, but part of the reason that the Germans are so well known for this myth of efficiency actually comes from things like Deutsche Homag's punch card machines. And actually, their punch card machines were created by IBM scientists, if you could call them that, and engineers, which I think is more accurate, who built this for census taking. Now, these, these machines were very simple. They're just machines that would add up columns and rows, and they would output information and cross-correlate them and tabulate them. And these machines were used primarily for census data. So they would take information about the German population, and they would say, OK, on this block, there are this many children, there are this many Jews, there are this many communists, there are this many such and such, right? And Thomas Watson, who ran IBM at the time, did a pretty good job of denying direct connections with most of the subsidiaries around the world with what they did. But Deutsche Homag was pretty shameless about this, and they were quite aware of what it was that they were building. And there's a wonderful book by Edwin Black. It's called IBM and the Holocaust. And I would really encourage you to read this book. It's probably the most important book of the 20th century with regards to how surveillance in the 21st century may go. So if you go to ibmandtheholocaust.com, I think it is, you can see some excerpts from the book. And I think it's important for understanding when we think that things cannot happen again, that we explain what has happened in the past. And to better understand the past, it will tell us about what possibilities exist for our future. And that isn't to say that such things will happen again, except it is to say that in the 20th century, we did see that happen again and again. It just was a different scale, right? And sometimes this happened without surveillance. But when people suggest that surveillance has no harm, it is to deny history, in fact. For example, to last week as well, uh, I got a chance to ask Carl Bildt, who is the foreign minister of Sweden, why he you know, supports the FRA law in Sweden, which is a dragnet surveillance law for spying on every bit of internet, telephone, SMS, and so on that flows through Sweden's borders. And he said that it was legitimate for foreign intelligence purposes, which is a really interesting thing if you're not Swedish, because it means that he has declared that spying on you is legitimate um, because you're not Swedish, you know, for some reason. Now, I personally think that this is a kind of tyranny, but when we, when we look at these systems and we look at them in a historical perspective, as well as where they are situated today, it's particularly scary because some of the people deploying these systems don't seem to understand this history. So I don't think that Carl Bildt is an evil guy because of that, for example. There are other reasons. But it seems to me that the things that he says make sense in that as long as he's in control of this surveillance system, it will only be used in service of democratic, liberal state ideology. Right? So in theory, this should be fine. Because surely no one has ever lost control of their computer systems. Right? The last talk that we saw, or the Angolan activist that I just mentioned, these are examples actually of how that does happen. And in fact, in Greece in 2002 or 2004, there's a thing known as the Athens incident, or the Athens affair. And this is where the prime minister of Athens, as well as a number of members of parliament, 
as well as other people, were actually wiretapped by unknown parties using the so-called lawful interception, the interception systems of their own telephone switches. So, you know, the United States built these telephone switch standards for spying on people, and they get deployed everywhere. So there's a trickle-down effect, which is that Greece gets them just the same way that Iran gets them, just the same way that the U.S. has them. And the theory goes that, you know, the FBI in the United States is legitimate, and so they go to a court, a competent court, and of course they never abuse this officially, and so it should be fine. But then these technologies are deployed elsewhere, right? So is it, as it happens in the, Greek, in the Greek example, the person who ran the telephone switch, he was actually found hanged to death in his apartment after this uh, was uncovered. Now, of course it makes sense that he would be found dead if, for example, someone other than him put him up to this. Right? Because it, it's a beneficial thing to deploy these wiretaps for political, economic, or social gain. And then, instead of the military, which traditionally protects these types of systems, um, it's actually just some computer nerd. So one of you probably has access to this telephone switch in India, in the Indian context. And so an interesting thing is that by building in these back doors, the weakest link becomes that person in the room, whoever you might be. Don't raise your hand. So when we start to combine these things together, we start to see some pretty uncomfortable things. First of all, if we look at the mandatory identification with things like, I think it's uh, UIM is what it is? UID, UID, right? And we look at the central monitoring system, it is not the case that it will be perfect. It is just the case that there will be enough information collected to be good enough to cause people to behave differently, right? Because to watch is to control. And I won't like cite verse and uh, line of Foucault here, but it sure, it, it's worth mentioning that I'm not the first and I will not be the last person to mention that surveillance is a kind of control. But it's also in service of other kinds of control. And so the UID system and the central monitoring system, of course it's run by a government and there are people that will say that they're incompetent or they're disorganized and they won't do a great job. But they just have to do a good enough job to screw with innocent people who would otherwise be more free for the program to be successful. And these are things that deserve resistance. That is not protest, right? Protest, as Elrika Meinhof would say, is when you don't go along with a thing. And resistance is when you stop other people from going along too. I don't agree with how she went about it. I actually think it's a better idea to build alternatives to these systems. So instead of having a centralized system with biometrics where now if someone wants to steal your identity, they either lift your fingerprint or cut off your hand, it doesn't seem like the kind of security I would like, maybe instead someone could build a, a blinded Chami and ID system, for example, where you can prove who you are, but no one can actually, you know, cut off your hand and impersonate you. Where maybe the state does not have that personal information so that someone in the state's database cannot, for example, print out a copy of your fingerprint and then leave it somewhere. I mean, these things sound very far-fetched, but uh, I think just a week ago at a place very near here, people were doing workshops about transferable fingerprints. Right? So we live in the future where those things are real. So when we centralize the collection of this kind of information, we actually centralize the place that an attacker would like to attack all of society in order to have control of the system of control. So these things, I think, are, are extremely, extremely terrifying, especially when we consider, for example, um, the former head of the research and analysis wing, and I were on a panel at the National Law School a couple of days ago on Saturday. And he talked about how it's a necessity to be able to do uh, interception and wiretapping. Well, this is a really interesting thing because he also talked about not really understanding technology. And so I think the point is not that this person or Ra, that, that, that they are evil or that they have terrible intentions. In fact, I think it's quite the opposite. He's a really sweet, nice guy, actually. I was quite surprised by how nice he is. But it is the case that it does not matter what his intentions are because we cannot secure general purpose computing systems. We can try, but there's a threshold of attack. Thanks. There's a threshold of attack where someone will probably win. And so having a centralized registry of all of this information, it leads us to think about the historical shifts that have happened in the past and how they might repeat. So if there is a valid concern about national defense or about espionage or about terrorism, does it make sense to build a centralized system full of your phone records, your internet browsing, your social history, your fingerprints, to put that in one place where someone who gets a job at this place now has that information? The person that does the, the backup of the database has this about every person? And what happens when someone has this information and they wish that they had your wife or your husband? Well, what happens is that you lose, right? And you lose at a societal scale. 
So what we need to do is we need to build alternative systems that allow us to have some of these benefits without all of these downsides. And in the book Cypherpunks that Julian Assange, myself, Andy Mullamagoon, and Jeremy Zimmerman wrote, it's available on the Pirate Bay. You can buy it in paper, but I suggest you download it on the Pirate Bay. Um, you know, we talk about some of these things. So if you haven't downloaded it from the Pirate Bay, you have my blessing. I don't have any permission to give it away, but it's there, so take it. And by take it, I mean make a copy of it and leave one behind. So we talk about this in the book, and we talk about how that means that the internet, you know, in theory, when we allow everyone to connect, it allows us to be free. And allows us to communicate freely, like just for the cost of connectivity, and sometimes in some places for the nominal cost of some number of megabytes of data or number of seconds connected. And you, know, you see around the world that there's some variation on this. But generally speaking, the idea is that you're free. But without encryption, without cryptography, and I don't mean something where you need to really understand how this works. The fact is the internet is not secure. And when you communicate, almost certainly by default, it is not secure. It is either insecure against legal attacks or it is insecure against technical and legal attacks. And that fact is concerning because when we have dragnet surveillance of the fiber interconnect points that come into India, for example, that means that someone can see those communications. So you take a little bit of a, a step to the side, I think, or we take a step to the side, where people, in theory, have this great ability to communicate, and we're free to do so, and we're free to say what we want. But there's a person in the audience here who is charged under Section 69A? 66A, right? So here, you know, here's the question. Are we really free? Or are we really free to have some serious consequences? You know, the, there's this, this theory about Mao, where he talks about how we should let a thousand flowers bloom. Have you guys all heard that phrase? Well, the backstory to that is not about free software, like everybody should, you know, write a thousand different projects and we'll sort it out in the end. The, the sort of, you know, really simple summed up version of that story is that everybody talked about their concerns and put up posters and everything like that, and then Mao wiped them all out. Right? So we live in a time of great openness. But it isn't the case that the asymmetry of power is in our favor, necessarily. And so while we see this great openness, and we see some of the crackdowns, this has happened to me, it has happened to this person in the audience, and many people think it will not happen to them. And that's wonderful privilege. I wish I could be burdened with it. Um, but I'm not. And I actually don't think anybody is. Right? We, if we try to live in this post-privacy world, what we will actually find is we still don't live in a post-privilege world. Right? So if you ever fear for your physical safety, Right? If you ever have concerns about like, the emergence of sexual assault in your country, you know you don't live in a post-privileged society. And so when we look at the surveillance machine and we look at the identification, who is to say that we really have privacy when all of this information is belong to a bureaucrat and the people that they hire? In my opinion, it, 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 su it suggests that in a sense we still have some privacy, but we're losing it in a very large way. So for example, CC television. Right? This is, uh, like a, in theory, not a big deal. You just have a couple of cameras. But in the future, as they start to become interconnected, as they start to do shape recognition and facial recognition, we start to lose our anonymity in the real world. On the internet, in theory, you can use things like Tor to try to protect yourself. You can use things like TechSecure to encrypt your text messages, or Redphone to encrypt your calls. But the majority of people, probably in this room, use things like Skype. And Skype allows for some kinds of interception by law enforcement. And it's done in secrecy. Microsoft even has patents that they filed about these kinds of interception techniques because they, they want to make sure that people, what, license them? And they make money from other kinds of spying by other companies? I mean, that's a little concerning in itself. But if we look at this and we think about it in a unified sense, that's when it becomes really terrifying. Because if what the Nazis were able to do with the census and some punch card machines were ever to be attempted by a society in the near future, think about how much worse it would be, how much more specific it would be. And can you imagine such a thing? It would allow for precision targeted killing. And in fact, in Pakistan, that's exactly what we see my country doing. We see drone attacks, which are done by what are commonly known as signature strikes. Right? So what is internet freedom? Internet freedom is the ability to post a video on YouTube and not be killed by a flying robot. But we don't live in that world. There is no internet freedom like that. Because in fact, Anwar al-Waki, who is, as far as I can tell, guilty of being a Muslim on YouTube, and he wasn't even convicted of that in a court, I might add, he has been talked about by the President of the United States, Obama, 
as if he has had a trial by jury. And so this is where we start to see it all come together, which is that the immense amount of information and the availability of this information, it allows us to make decisions about people in a way that is not fundamentally in line with how we have always done so before killing someone, for example. So Anwar al waki was killed by a drone, and two weeks later, his 16-year-old son, who was guilty of nothing, he was also killed by a drone. Right? So these things actually are happening in a similar way, but they're a little harder to object to because they are very targeted. And now, the really scary part is that just last week, Obama got up and he said that these drones, they actually save lives. I mean, it cannot really become more Orwellian when a guy talks about murdering people and saving lives in the exact same sentence. It's ridiculous. This is a, a travesty for due process. It is a travesty for anything that looks like justice. And when the president then talks about the guilt of the person and talks about all of these things he's alleged to have done, well, this tells us, in a sense, that fundamental core parts of due process have simply been thrown out the window. And what we see with the United States now is that it took many years for this to become public. And so one of the most concerning parts is the signature strike. And the signature strike is the idea that we all leave behind a data trail. So you're familiar with the concerns about data retention, I suspect, right? Anyone not familiar with data retention? Okay, one person, that's great. So data retention is this idea that people record information, corporations, governments, the things you do on the internet, data you leave behind. And they record it and they correlate it together and then they can go back and retroactively look at it. Now in Europe and in other countries, this is like IP addressing information or maybe click data from your web browsing history. Or maybe your physical location as you walk around. Um, there's a guy, I think his name is Malta Spitz and Der Spiegel did a story about his cell phone records and it showed everywhere he went. So to give you an idea, who here has a cell phone? <laughs> Don't be shy, it's okay. I'm, I've got one too, I'll show it to you in just a moment. Um, but um, this, this is a really interesting thing, this data retention idea, because it allows us to do something we could not do 100 years ago, which is that you can retroactively see where everyone has been, see who they've interacted with, who they've talked with, and in some cases, depending on, well, luck or targeting, you'll know what they've said. So this is what, when we talk about data retention, we refer to when we talk about signature strikes. So a signature strike is this idea that you have the pattern of a guilty person. You have called people that, that we believe we believe are guilty, that we think are doing terrible things. You've gone to markets that other bad people have gone to. And so drones are dispatched and you are executed. And that happens now in Pakistan. But it is not the Pakistanis that do it, although it seems to be that they condone it. It is the American government that does this. And it was just last week that Obama went up and talked about how good this was and how righteous it was and how it saves lives in the same breath as talking about assassinating people without a trial, which is a crime in my country, or at least it used to be. And it is a crime internationally as well, especially in sovereign territories. So when we talk about the internet and data retention and cell phones, what we have to remember is that it is directly tied to things that seem to have no connection. That is, your ability to live without being killed by a flying robot, which is crazy, except that it's also true and it's also happening. So when we leave this data trail behind about ourselves, it tells a story about us, which is not actually the truth as we would tell it. It's what we would call a data doppelganger, right? The problem is that in the world in which we live now, people seem to believe that the data doppelganger is more real than what you think about yourself. So it tells these things and it says you definitely were at this place. You absolutely said these things to these people via text message. You really hold these beliefs. You really do associate with these folks. Well, freedom of association is a fundamental human right as well. But when we are under such heavy suspicion all of the time, when we're being logged in these ways, the way that it has flipped, especially for an intelligence agency or agencies all around the world, it was said, in fact, by the man from the research and analysis wing. He said that often this is used to prove people's innocence. What is wrong with that sentence? I mean. There are many things, but the core thing that's wrong is the idea that they don't have to prove your guilt and that you're not innocent until you are proven guilty. This is also a tyranny, this idea that you are not innocent, right? And it is especially scary when we consider that what if they can't come up with the information that proves you to be innocent? Well, then what happens to you then? Well, then perhaps they dispatch you. If you happen to unfortunately be a Muslim in a particular part of Pakistan, 
or in 70 countries where America has drones deployed, 70, 70 countries. What does that say? Well, it says that the concerns about things like punch card machines, they're actually extremely relevant. And we can see that they're tied together. And while comparisons to the Holocaust are old and tired and completely ridiculous, what we must recognize is they're not old and tired in the sense that there is no connection. It's old and tired in the sense that it is a matter of scale and about industrialization and about brutality and about genocide. So this is not about genocide with these drones. This is about memicide. The idea that there are certain people who hold ideas, hold information that is so dangerous that they must be exterminated without due process, without perfect information, without a trial. This is a terrifying thing. So when we talk about universal identification and the central monitoring system, this is the world that every nation is trying to build right now. So that's the thing that is most concerning to me and why, in fact, I will never travel to Pakistan and why I do not carry a cell phone. Because it's obvious that these types of things do happen to real people and regular people, people who don't believe it will happen to them. So this is, to me, one of the most concerning aspects of our current society. And so the internet, in theory, while very liberating, appears to be a little bit more like Mao's suggestion that we should let a thousand flowers bloom. And then people will then take that information and selectively pick those people off because they have revealed their true beliefs. And then once that has happened, we can suggest that they're guilty or talk about what a terrible person they were after they've been killed without a trial, like my president has shamefully done last week on television. Right? I mean, what a shame for the United States to have that guy get up there and talk about that. It's not only illegal, it's just ridiculous. And it's preposterous. So this is the thing that is at stake around the entire world. And we talk about this in the Cypherpunks book. And it's a little uncomfortable because it seems preposterous. And it seems like obviously these systems won't be misused. Obviously the people that run them, they're benevolent and they're generous and they won't harm us and they won't persecute us. But I mean, is that true? And how will we know? What systems for auditing do we have? We have none. What kind of transparency is forced on these people? Almost nothing. When we ask them, and when our representatives ask about this, we generally are not given real facts. Usually it's hidden behind state secrecy and classifications. And this, of course, is also an affront to democracy. But it is said that this is how it must be. But whenever someone does say such a thing, we must challenge them. We must say, how can there be a state secret from the people that give you legitimacy? But this is hard to say because it takes courage to say it. And it has consequences when it is said. If we look at Julian Assange, we see those consequences right now, where he sits inside of the Ecuadorian embassy in London, unable to freely move, even though he has been granted political asylum. So, I mean, I suppose that I could sort of talk about some other aspects of it. I could talk about deep packet inspection, or I could talk about like credit card logs and how when you tie all these things together, it just gets better and better and better. And machine learning sort of takes this data and then it automatically flags people, including the pattern in which they walk and how they deviate and how there are anomalies. That's like a, a sort of different talk. That is to say that we could talk about that endlessly. But those things are real and they do exist and they are quite concerning. And so we sort of see the death of civil society in a sense on its way. We can sort of see it in the distance, I think because people will be less likely to speak up. For example, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty will not declare Bradley Manning a political prisoner because they fear pissing off the United States, which lots of Americans fund them, so how dare they spit in the face and suggest that America could do anything like that, like Guantanamo Bay or drone killings, because we have like a no stain on our human rights record. So. I think we must look at these things, but it takes intense study because these are deeply technical issues and they have historical roots that are highly uncomfortable. They're especially uncomfortable when we look at how these things have repeated, but just not as efficiently and not as seriously throughout history, especially in the 20th century and especially across all of Europe, both East and West, right? All of Europe. And we see these things right now very close to here. And who better than you guys and when better than now to talk about it? So I, I wanted to show you one thing, which is to say that when we talk about APT, we should probably talk about what these things actually mean for effective activists. So I joke that APT0 is like, you know, your local intelligence agency, right? The advanced persistent threat. Well, it doesn't really take a lot, but here's a great example of the types of things that people find when they start to speak out about these issues. This is a cell phone um, for, ostensibly, I believe, for blind people. 
you guys ever seen one of these at all? No? Okay, well, you see the big keypad and all that? This cell phone can be programmed to answer our calls automatically, and it was found behind a television set bolted to the wall in a friend's apartment in London after he went to visit Julian. And inside, it has some notes about the phone number and the SIM card. And um, when my friend found it and deactivated it, he um, got a visit from two people the following day who did not believe that he was there. And so they actually opened the door to his apartment and went inside and were quite surprised to find him sitting in bed under the covers, looking, saying, what are you doing in my apartment that I have rented? And of course, they said, oh, we're here about an inspection. The company knows about it. Of course, the company knew nothing about this inspection because they, these people were there to retrieve this phone, which, well, as you can tell, they didn't do a very good job of that. Um, these types of things are an example where if you were to ask the cell phone company whose SIM card this was, if you were to ask them who has placed this phone here and where was it first activated, the asymmetry of this situation is such that you will not learn this information. So we must ask ourselves, if we collect all of this information, and it is the case that people use it to violate our human rights. If it is the case that they use it in these secret ways, will we be able to use this giant database to protect ourselves? And what is the difference between cops and thieves that behave in such a way? And it turns out that there is one big difference, and one is above the law. You know, that to me is pretty interesting. At the National Law School, it says, no matter how high you are, none are above the law, I believe is the quote. But that's not true. Just ask anybody here who's ever met an intelligence service person. Of course they're above the law. And so when we build these systems, we actually become beholden to a type of coup that the world has pretty much never seen, should someone choose to undertake it. So in this sense, we have a real fight for democracy across the whole planet, where we get rid of secrecy and we replace it with transparency almost always, except in very small temporary windows, which are known that these things will become public. And when we find things that we cannot reveal about the world, it tells us something about those things. For example, when we talk about how, well, you wouldn't want to reveal atomic launch codes, well, doesn't that instead tell you that there is quite a risk about having atomic weapons? Because a bad guy will probably learn these launch codes. Like in the United States, we learned about three years ago that they were all zeros. <laughs> Isn't that a little bit terrifying, though? I mean, that's one of the most legitimate secrets. How is it that it came to be known in public here in India? Well, because there really are only secrets that are kept from the general public. Otherwise, there really aren't secrets, right? There are people who conspire. And these conspiracies often, they are generally just regarded as business plans when they benefit the state and its surveillance capabilities. So when you, if you're a software developer, when you work on these things, you can ask yourself if regular people benefit from your work, right? If your work will be used to dominate and to enslave, or if your work will be used to liberate. So if you work on targeted malware to break into people's computers, what happens when that is used against you? How would you feel about this? Right? And this is, of course, a question that no one wants to ask themselves because they want to think that they're righteous and they're correct. But of course, this requires a debate, and there is no debate with this kind of secrecy. And there really isn't even the ability to organize in an effective way if we have these kinds of surveillance systems and they're used to thwart and to break up these kinds of organizations, these kinds of debates. So we live in a really critical juncture in history, the golden age of surveillance, if you will, where if we choose to do things in a way where we reject secrecy and we embrace actual democratic ideals, where we embrace transparency, then I think that we have a pretty good shot at building a world which is quite amazing. And maybe if we're lucky, we'll get off this rock and explore space for all time. That would be pretty fantastic. But it's not the case that we're going to get another Carl Sagan. It's not the case that we're going to find ourselves actually being free in the future. Because when people control these systems, they get to make that choice for us. They get to find out who's important in our social graph. They get to arrest those people, harass those people, wiretap those people, and leak their phone calls. So when people talk about cybersecurity and they say, ah, you know what we should do? We should, we should spy on the whole internet so that we can make everybody secure. What we should say instead is, no, let us make sure that our internet is actually secure. And when you go to spy, you are thwarted then we will know that we have a secure internet. So when people say we must wiretap in order to make our country secure, we can say, no, no, we should not do that. If you can wiretap, that means that so can that guy up there on stage. And in fact, that is true. 
if you look at gsmmap.org for India, you'll see that someone has in fact been in India and looked at the cell phone networks. And all of the cell phone networks here are vulnerable to various different attacks, if they even use encryption at all. So for about 30 US dollars, you can get a Motorola C123 phone and load it with the Osmocom baseband baseband, and you can sniff GSM, which means you can clone people's phones. So this is the trade-off we make societally so that some people can spy on a few people, which has untold economic problems. So if we look at all of the systems this way, we can make a very similar analysis, which is basically the proposal that we should have a vanguard that watches us and takes care of us, which is an affront to democracy as well. Because the idea is that we should all care about these issues and we should work together to fix them. So that means that what we should do is actually secure them, not hand over our security to a small cabal of unaccountable people that are not transparent and that do not respect our privacy or our civil liberties. So there's a bit about Tor, I suppose, that we could say there to try to protect yourself. But ultimately, if these things are socially successful, no technology will liberate you because you will not liberate people who have become slaves. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Uh, thanks for the talk. So one um, question that uh, I think uh, at least I find difficult is, uh, like like you mentioned about information and who, who should have access to that information. So uh, are there legitimate, uh, I mean, there seem to be legitimate causes for this information uh, to be mined by someone else. So for instance, uh, in, in, the, in the world that we live in, um, there is obviously a, a, a certain crime threat and uh, this data can be used to prevent crime and it is, I'm guessing, in some cases used to do that. So what is very difficult to kind of draw a line at is that uh, where this data, uh, where this information is used constructively and, uh, and, and the problem is that if this information is there, it will ob almost obviously be used destructively. So uh, should this information be collected at all, uh, given that there are constructive uses of it? I mean, in an ideal world, every person would have absolute control over their own data, and every time such a, a request would have to be made, uh, that person would have the ability to choose whether to share that data or not. But let's say for medical research purposes or, or crime prevention purposes, there are uh, actual genuine reasons for this information to be mined. And uh, I, I challenge you on that, in that uh, I think that there are legitimate points to be made about this, but I suppose what I am suggesting here is that we have seen historically when this information is collected about terrorism, we find out later that the terrorists weren't really terrorists, they just happened to be of a class of people that were not welcome in society. So when we talk about the security aspects, we can, I think, clearly weigh that, and we have traditionally had courts that have weighed this in many places, not in all places, obviously. And so when we see this type of surveillance and we see the assertion that it is only going to be used for good at first without actually addressing the historical terrible things that happen with this kind of data, I think we should just not accept that. And as far as things like medical privacy or research of that, I think it's perfectly reasonable for someone to donate information or to share information with informed consent. So it's the difference between surveillance SUS surveillance, that is, people watching people from below that are above them, and um, a term I guess you could say is like memoir-vélance or surveillance or something. I don't speak French, so I'm just winging it here. But the idea that you're allowed to watch yourself, so they're like quantified self. I do not suggest that you shouldn't know how many calories you've consumed. I just suggest that when you note that down, that there should not be the case that someone may just demand it of you because you use the internet. Like if you write it down in Evernote, is it really the case that the US government should simply be able to take it without a court? And really, should they be able to go to Evernote and ask for this information in a way where they're gagged and you don't ever get to learn, let alone to defend it? And then they interpret it in such a way that you didn't write down the number of calories you ate, that was actually some other thing, which they've made up a story about. So there are different kinds of data collection, and I don't object to all of them. I merely object to the idea that you should always be without consent and that these things should be done to your data, and that you should really have no say in it, and that people will always throw around the four horsemen of the infopocalypse, child pornography, terrorism, money laundering, and the war on some drugs. <laughs> right? You've heard this. We've got to do it because of child porn. We've got to do it because of the war on drugs. We've got to do it because of terrorism. Right? Well, how many people were beat up by cops on the internet? 
right? How many people have been beaten up by cops at protests? How many of them are on the internet? I would suggest probably more than there are child pornographers on the internet. But we don't go about censoring the internet because some assholes exist there. Right? And we shouldn't go about surveilling it because some people who are violent, like corrupt police, are in fact using the internet. The internet presents a, a huge place, telephones present a huge place for freedom of connection. And this is very important. And without instilling this with cryptography, we will not have this, and we will have people that will have access to this data, and they will misuse this data. And there's a historical trend of it, and we see it with people who are politically persecuted and prosecuted, like Julian, like myself, like Manning, probably like this nice woman in the front row. We're merely speaking our mind is the thing, and it's not about terrorism. I mean, I myself have been called a terrorist by my government, and I would say I, do not, I don't actually use violence, I use reason. If reason is terrorism, well, we have a very different discussion. So I really don't think that we should just accept this blindly, this idea that it will always be used for good. And in fact, I think we should ask for proof and citations, and we should ask for evidence that shows that it hasn't been misused and that people have not been harmed by this. And I think we will see, in fact, that there is great historical proof of harm. And so it is for that reason that we should not make that trade-off without informed consent, and that requires a great democratic debate across the whole of the world. Because once we move to a surveillance state, it will be very difficult to move away from it. And that's not a trade-off that just a few people should make. But if the whole world really overwhelmingly wants to spy on everyone, I look forward to a day in which none of you wear clothes. Because that's what we're talking about. We will all be unclothed to the people that have access to this database. Great. I'm glad to hear it. Sorry, uh, I think Indian context is the Tata uh, rule which was passed, and similar rules which were passed in all the terrorism affected states. And you saw that, uh, I think, we all saw the misuse of Tata and other related issue things. And uh, just to ask, I think, Jacob is basically, it's very cynical to live in, or rather you feel very cynical, maybe after the age or something. I'm like an that. optimist. No, no, <laughs> I'm talking about myself. It's like we have we are the country with ten different ID cards, or I think yeah. each one for different set of things. Then we have um, uh, uh, we also are basically monitored pretty much pretty much everything by RTOs and NTOs and all kind of organizations in the name of all the fo either the four ones or at least the one which is used very heavily in our country. The democracies, as you described, one of the foremost democracy if you keep on one side, if democracies start adopting this, as you mentioned, and it has been happening for quite some time, the other guys that we normally used to associate with the, uh, the walled gardens, and the, uh, the guys you didn't speak about, but they are also always, they, are, they have been doing these things for quite a number of time, in an organized way or unorganized way. Unfortunately, we, 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 uh, the, what are the alternatives for democracy with, without s surrendering to the these other guys? I mean, I, I, I feel like I just spent half an hour telling yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the alternative is that when people say, let us secure the network by spying, we say, no, let us secure the network by using strong mathematics. When we get to a world in which, let's say in the Indian context, there is no more corruption, Maybe, maybe I could be wrong. I mean, I think you guys can get there. I don't know. You tell me. But, uh, you know, then maybe having this database is fantastic. Right? I mean, maybe that's the thing, is that maybe the problem is that we just need this database, you know, just to, to play devil's advocate here for a moment. Uh, you know, maybe what we need is we just need this database to ensure that we get rid of all the petty criminals. Right? We get rid of all the corruption. Right? And that's, that's a good argument, except that then you just end up with majorly empowered criminals. Right? But maybe this database will also be used to wipe those guys out, too. We'll just get rid of them. There, will never, there won't be the possibility of subverting these systems. It'll be a perfect system, and it will never be abused. I, don't, I tend to think, though, that the, the solution to these things is to not build them, to not help these things, to subvert them whenever possible, to undermine them, and sometimes just to straight up destroy them. But the best way that we can do this, I think, without taking action against anyone else, just taking action about ourselves and who we talk to, is to recognize the transit of risk that surveillance poses, just like people do with HIV, right? Wear a condom with HIV, use encryption with the internet. It's really simple. 
you wouldn't put your partner at risk. It would be rude, right? Unless they say yes, don't do it. And even if they were to say yes, well, you know, still probably don't do it because you don't know, <laughs> right? But let's just say that you wanted to. The transitive risk is, is still there. The transitive risk doesn't go away because people consent. So you just have to acknowledge that, right? We will never be safe. There, there are different kinds of safety, right? And so when we have these kinds of systems, probably what we want to do is try to, on an individual basis, do these things, but also know that we must do them on a societal-wide scale. And if we do them on a societal-wide scale, then people who don't sit in this room, who don't understand these things, then we'll have a chance. So the people that build applications in here, when we build strong cryptography, when we categorically refuse to put back doors into software, which we must do, I believe, you have a choice. Right? But I really think you should never put a back door in. Like in Tor, I will leave the United States forever before I would ever put a back door in. And I know a lot of other people feel that way too. Because one back door is one too many. And it even puts us at risk. So if we, if we build these systems, and we build them to be actually secure, it is from that security that we may ensure the security of our democracies. And maybe, in some cases, you can still use your democracies now to put in strong privacy legislation. To say that if a lawyer talks to people over the internet without encryption, that there's some kind of negligence. You know, it's, it's very straightforward. And maybe there are economic incentives to make that happen. I don't know. That's for you to figure out. But I do believe that mathematics can really help us in a way that the physical world used to help us with regard to organizing and economic costs of surveillance and so on. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. Uh, sorry, we have another question there. OK, um, sorry. Yeah, so I guess it's pretty, um, like the issues are fairly apparent to most of the people in this room. But um, I personally find it hard to um, talk to people who might otherwise not be interested of their own accord in these things. And I was wondering if you have any sort of standard or like go-to anecdotes or some sort of way to get people more interested and more engaged in these topics. I, again, I encourage you to download on the Pirate Bay the book Cypherpunks mm -hmm. and give it as a gift to someone then have a discussion with them. It's a good start, I think, for regular people that are not technologically inclined. It's not perfect. Um, but I mean, it's a, it is a, it's a long-term campaign where we haven't seen the devastating effects of it yet. We, in fact, often just see people who benefit from it talking about how great it is and how they need more of it. Right? So the expansion of authoritarianism that we see is something people can relate to unrelated to technology. But it's, it's difficult because each person is different. Some people wish to say that they should have a master, for example. I know people who say, I don't want to decide these things. I want someone else to decide them for me. And those people exist. And there's nothing wrong with taking that point except that in some cases, the choices that they make impact you, and they take away your ability to make a choice about it. So it's hard to reach some of those people, and I think, in fact, we can't reach all of them. But what we can hopefully do is work with people who have the ability to change the laws, and then to change those laws in such a way that the default becomes the safe thing, where safe is defined as actually being secure, and not secure except when a court orders it, to be this way, a court that doesn't even understand what TCPIP is, doesn't know what a kernel is, doesn't know what, you know, anything about technology is before they legislate about it, right? That, I think, is the best bet that we have. And in fact, I think it's mostly about national security and economics, not civil liberties, that we will make this progress. Because for the most part, people don't care to uh, sacrifice their political careers by pushing for civil liberties. They do often really care about making money for India, for example, and keeping India secure against aggressors. And I think, you know, as awful as, as it is to sort of embrace these ideas, which often turn out as blind nationalism, which I think is quite dangerous, it is without a doubt the case that those things are going to make more of an impact for most people in their mind than this idea that people who upset society have rights. It's, it's, it's very hard. But I could be wrong. And I think each person has to look at their own context. And it's, it's a difficult problem to address in a generic solution. And so the book is may be useful, but you know, it's also like, you know, four white guys on a sofa. So take it for what it is. Uh, this is a question about anonymity. Um, uh, so we all know some proposed sort of applications where co collecting some data about people and centralizing it um, can be useful uh, if, you know, if it's anonymized and then it's safe. So like for, we were talking about n jotting down your calories on Evernote, but you know there are 
probably a lot of interesting research directives and public health that could be you know, gleaned from that sort of data. And a lot of people propose uh, uh, anonymizing that data to protect people's privacy. But then we've also seen lots of interesting research that says that anonymous data can be actually very easily de-anonymized by cross-correlating it with your social graph or whatever other data is known about you. Um, so can you comment as to the practicality or even the possibility of you know, any such initiatives that do centralize anonymous data, can that be done securely or is it just, you know, it's anyone's guess? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's important to try to anonymize data sets. But I actually think that it's really hard. And so almost everybody that tries seems to fail. And there's a, there's a conference called the Privacy Enhancing Technology Summit. It's happening in Bloomington, Indiana this year. I'm not sure where it will happen next year. I would encourage all of you to go if you can, although that might not be possible. They have stipends for students. And this is exactly the problem that is discussed at places like PETS, as it is, is uh, colloquially known. Um, I think that you know there are techniques for anonymizing some kinds of uh, data that do seem to be helpful. So for example, in the Tor network, we have some statistics at metrics.torproject.org. And you can see the number of Tor users from India, for example. And the way that we do that is that the very first relay in the Tor connection that you make, it sees that you're coming from India, and it puts this in a buffer. And it says, I, I got a user from India in the last 24 hours. And then every 24 hours, it takes all those buffers, and it adds them up, and then submits them upstream. But it doesn't submit, for example, the actual IP address. It just says the country code. So of course, people that run a relay, they can screw with the statistics and so on. So we make sure to try to even that out across all of the relays that we receive data from. And there's a paper about this. And this is a great example of anonymizing data, which is that we were able to anonymize pretty much just one thing and draw one conclusion from it and then look at it in aggregate. And we think that when there are many people coming from a country, you would have a really hard time knowing it was Bob that came from India or something like this. So it can be done. And I think it would be very hard to take that data set and say, oh, it was Bob that was in India. This is hard, though, when you look at a country like North Korea and there's like 20 Tor users. OK, so maybe that's not so great. But hey, we have 20 Tor users, and I don't know who they are. right? And we see that. Um, maybe there's still 20. I don't know. I haven't looked in a while. But th you know, this kind of uh, anonymity, I think, from data sets is possible. And I think it's very powerful. It tells us things. It tells us, for example, whether or not we've had a censorship event in the country, because when we did have 35,000 people coming from Iran every day, and then one day we had zero. Well, we could guess that they guessed by protocol or by IP address or something that they had blocked the Tor network. And sure enough, they had. And we did an analysis. And then we deployed a patch to all the relays, because it was a server-side fix. And uh, all of a sudden, we had 35,000 people again. right? So that was really useful to do that. And it worked. And it was through anonymous data collection and analysis. I think that it's also important that we have an informed consent aspect. That is, when you run Tor, we say we collect these statistics. And we think that it doesn't harm you. And we don't get any extra information that the first relay, for example, would otherwise not have. Right? It's the same, it's the same thing. And so um, if you look at medical research, sometimes the way that this works is that like a doctor just gives that data up, and the person has no consent. And I think that that may result in some pretty great breakthroughs. But I'm not really very comfortable with it. I think that people have this right to exercise. And maybe they don't want to be part of a longitudinal study about you know, pre-diabetic people or something like that. And I think they should be able to make that choice. You know, It doesn't seem like they're actually going to be able to make that choice very much anywhere around the world. And so in trying to anonymize that data could be very useful. But it's still, without informed consent, without opting in, I think that it has very questionable ethical setups. And uh, you know, I find it a little, bit, a little bit terrifying. So if, though, you're working on a problem like this at the PETS community, writing a paper about it, looking at the previous submissions and other academic literature, be a great way to sort of get up to speed on all the things that didn't work and the few things that did. And then to know whatever you're going to try, uh, it might work. Um, for example, in Washington State, I worked on a paper called the Privacy Preserving Medical Marijuana Registry, or we actually just called it a Privacy Preserving Medical Registry, BPMR. But it was for marijuana. Like, let's, you know, no fronting, right? And, uh, and the idea was that uh, the federal government are a bunch of fascists, and they arrest cancer patients who are dying because they smoke marijuana. That's really fucked up. 
right? So we wanted to build a system where if you were a cancer patient, you could prove that you legitimately had been recommended the ability to smoke pot because it works for you, because your doctor says so, et cetera. And it should provide you with positive arrest protection. So a police officer can't say, oh, well, you smell like pot, you're dying from cancer, well, you're going to jail, <laughs> right? And the idea was you show them this card. And the thing is, the card is really simple. It's just a card with a random number on it. And the random number is in a database, and that's it. It's the simplest possible thing. It turns out that that's so simple that no one even bothered to build it. And so in many places, like in Oregon, the state directly south of Washington where I live, um, they had been collecting names of people, and I believe the quantity of the illegal drugs that they were buying, and putting this in a database. And of course, the federal government has gone for it, and I believe they may have even acquired it through legal means. In, in other states, it has been the case that when these places are robbed, these dispensaries of marijuana, they don't take the drugs or the money, they take the lists about people. So this is an example of a real world way that you can defeat such a system. You could probably also use it for a weapons registry of sorts. And in fact, Canada has a similar thing, or they did for a while, where the license for a firearm was the thing you had on you. And if you ever lost it, well, you're in trouble because they didn't have another copy of it. Right? And the idea was you don't centralize things, but you allow people to prove that they're authorized. And so this is sort of the flip side of that. And that allows you then to look at the data. And no matter what you do with the data, almost certainly, you'll be able to say that it is privacy preserving because you don't have their name, you don't have their address, their social security number, their birth date, you have nothing. You just know the number of people. It's a unidirectional registry. So those kinds of systems can be built. Um, ours was vetoed by the governor of Washington because she said she favored legalization. And then the next year we legalized marijuana. So we didn't need my stupid system, which is great. Hi, Jake. Over here. Hey. Hey. Uh, so, uh, uh -oh. just. It's going to be a fight. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, Let's go. But just a point that, that Bruce Schneier raised in one of his posts that, uh, that employing good security uh, measures uh, is less like, you know, wearing a condom or not sharing needles and a little bit more like keeping your hands clean or having good hygiene generally right and and I actually agree with that I think just the number of people who die die of diarrhea and dysentery every year just shows that it's it's a much tougher problem than than even AIDS uh, and and I think that it's uh, one other point uh, I agree completely with you uh, with your idea about the data doppelganger being a very uh, very threatening thing uh, the fact that data actually is the primary proof of who you are rather than what you say. But if we are to you know, stop prejudging people like that, and especially in events of crimes, when someone is being uh, tried, uh, the, the presumption is that you know, a person who has committed a crime will lie and say, I have not committed a crime, in order to, you, and rightly, the job is up to the state, up to the public prosecutors, to show that they have. Now, to show that they have, you need evidence. And I would say, uh, in most cases, you should have beyond something beyond circumstantial evidence. And to do that, you need to eventually be able to access uh, their communications in, in many circumstances, right? And uh, the technologies that, that you and I uh, encourage people to use Okay, and the protections that we say, uh, especially pr uh, in, in terms of both, uh, if it's on my disk, then I should not be forced to give up my, my uh, decryption key. And if it is in the traffic, then good security would mean that it is protected while in transit. Okay, all of this makes it very difficult for public prosecutors. Forget about intelligence agencies, etc. Just plain crimes and being able to show that you were the one who committed it. And, and this brings me to the larger point, which is that just as one uh, might argue that, uh, that it is senseless to talk about sacrificing privacy uh, in order to gain security, because after all, we need security so that we can uh, enjoy priv uh, you know, rights such as freedom of speech and privacy, it is also at, uh, quite problematic if we start you know, going down the path of sacrificing security to enhance privacy, because without security, we won't have the necessary condition to be able to enjoy 
that privacy, right? So that's the larger point. And well, I, so I agree with Bruce Schneier, although I just think that he is not. Uh, well, I think when it's presented as an either or, it's just like kind of ridiculous, right? It's not mutually exclusive. Of course, it's a little bit like washing your hands, but it is also like protecting yourself proactively while you engage in things. It's a harm reduction, you know, it's a harm reduction strategy, and so. I think that washing your hands is harm reduction, wearing a condom is harm reduction, not sleeping with people that you think are unsafe is a harm reduction strategy. There's like a whole bunch of things we can make as an analogy. But the point is the transitive risk exists in all of these analogies as well. And it's not gonna go away, it exists. And we can't get rid of the risk entirely. We won't change the behavior of all people, at least not if they're free. Right? We can change the behavior of all people, but that is not the idea. Right, of a society that is free. The idea is that people should choose what it is they wish to, to do. Right? Obviously, in the case of extreme poverty and disease, people often don't have the education to understand that they get to make this choice. So there's an interesting discussion point to be had about how the analogy sort of falls short because th all this technological privilege stuff is it's kind of a little bit highfalutin for everyday regular people sometimes. Um, but I think that the point is that I don't disagree with Schneier, but I would just say it's not limited to that. We each have our own analogy. There's preventative measures before you do a thing that is totally reasonable, and there are preventative harm reduction measures for things that you are going to do anyway. Right? We are going to use cell phones. We are going to use the internet. We should use strong cryptography when we do. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I think that we should recognize we each have a responsibility because a centralized management system of all computers is probably not gonna work out either. So we, you know, we can take this. I mean, the free software community works on distributing this work in a way that everyone benefits from. So I really think that we can have free and open source software for a free and open society, and this is a little bit like washing our hands. And then we can use strong cryptography to connect over hostile networks, and this is a little bit like protection in other ways. And you know, I realize that reasonable people will have different analogies. Uh, a lot of people really don't like talking about sex, for example, so they really don't like that, and they prefer to talk about washing their hands. But Whatever, right? I mean, I think that's very strange, but I understand that that's, that that's a point. And, you know, so I guess I should say I don't really disagree with him in that I also think that that is a reasonable analogy. And as for the second part, I feel like I couldn't help but imagine George Orwell writing what you have said. Um, and I mean that with all due respect, which is that there is a tension that exists, which is that it would be so much easier to catch every criminal if there was a policeman in every house if every phone call was recorded at all times, if you had no rights against incriminating yourself, if you had no right to remain silent, just think about how easy it would be to catch all of those criminals, right? Absolutely. I don't want to live in that world. I think that, uh, I think it was Blackwell, he suggested that you should ensure that some guilty people go free so that innocent people will actually be able to go free as well, right? And this is the you know, fundamental equation that we have in our liberal democracy, which is that the presumption of innocence is a thing we should not get rid of. No, Suspicion. No, 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 but you are and you don't know it, and that's what's terrifying. <laughs> you see, because the thing is that freedom from suspicion is a fundamental grounding freedom that allows us to build other freedoms. So when you know you pick up the phone and later it will be used against you, you will choose your words differently. Can you be said in your mind, can you say honestly that when you pick up the phone, you speak totally freely? And if the answer is no, like for example, would you call me in your hotel room or in my hotel room? Would you send me an email as freely? Would you choose your words more carefully knowing that the FBI probably reads my email? I know a lot of people who have told me they don't call me anymore. They don't talk to me. I'm not on Facebook, but if I was, they would unfriend me, right? And the point is that that kind of suspicion crosses the threshold in my mind. Because I generally agree with you, except here's the thing. Criminals understand how the system works. And regular people don't. And when you don't understand how the system works, the system can be used against you in unjust ways. Criminals can take their phone and put it in a train and have an alibi. Have it set to automatically answer. So they can have been on the call, for example. They can have it set to play an audio track that's pre-recorded. They can falsify the data trail. Because when we build the thing that you're talking about, when we think about this balance where we say, well, we want them to have the ability to do a wiretap to retroactively police, you, you advocate for retroactive policing of data. And when they do that, who is it that will trick the system except the person that already wishes to break the law? 
And so when we talk about retroactive policing, what we have to recognize is that if we compromise our systems in order to have retroactive policing, because it would be beneficial, that this is a huge problem. That is not at all what I'm suggesting. All that I'm saying is that there is a huge problem if uh, in terms of legal standards such as uh, uh, such as that which which is very fundamental of not of presuming people to be innocent until proven guilty that these kinds of principles okay are right now being hammered upon absolutely and one of the reasons that they are under threat is encryption okay in India I don't, think have that, I don't think that it's encryption. I think it's actually power. But we can talk about how power is being thwarted, and then we might say encryption. But it's about power. Of course. And power operating through legal regimes covering encryption. Okay. So uh, in India, for instance, we have a law uh, which requires you uh, to decrypt something that is encrypted. Now, in in the US different courts have taken different stands on whether this can be allowed or not whether this violates the right against self encryption uh, self incrimination or not uh -huh. okay uh, there is no uniform law around this in the world but the fact is the moment you go from something that you know okay which is where uh, things like uh, which is where generally we have had protections okay uh, to when it comes to things that are stored on a file, okay, this is a new thing. No, it's not. It's the exact same thing that we had before, which no, is so you had a file, they found a file, and they're the laws telling relating you... To, the laws relating to letters, for instance, okay, are different from the laws relating to things that are in your mind. But the principle is the same. This is the right against self-incrimination. You can apply it in law, and you can have an unconstitutional law. And I understand you have some laws that seem quite unconstitutional. And I argue that the current law that we have on the statute books in India about requiring decryption is unconstitutional. Sure. But throughout the world, if a police officer, for instance, why is it okay uh, in the U.S. for a police officer to find an unlocked phone and use the information that is on the phone? Okay. And throughout the world, that is that kind of thing is generally fine. If a, someone finds a letter, okay, then that is fine. Except that we didn't note everything down on letters earlier. Okay. Now more and because of technology, more and more things are being, you know, put outside of us. Sure. Okay, which is where the, the laws against self incrimination protect us. But what now you, my, what you, said, you said something is, very specific, which is what I am reacting to, yeah. which is that you're talking about how we lose security when we have this much privacy. No, what I'm, I do believe that there can be situations where you can lose security. Can you show some evidence of how we have lost security when people have their privacy retained? Because I would generally say that this is the balance between liberty and security. And so I wonder what it is that, that leads you to say that. Because I, I think maybe there's an example in India that I'm not familiar with, and I would like to, to know it. So I am talking in the abstract. Okay. Uh, but, be, but can you be concrete in an example? No, my, con my concrete example is people, for instance, if you have to retain the, the legal presumption of innocence, okay, then what avenue is there of, you know, without changing that legal presumption, if everything in the world is encrypted? What avenue is there for a public prosecutor to actually s show uh, evidence? Well, I suppose it would be the same as it was 150 years ago before there were computers. Not quite. Uh, precisely because the problem that I'm, uh, that I'm saying, technology is changing things. In a There's country of people where there are people that are illiterate that have committed crimes, yeah. how is it different? So because everyone now has so the protection so of an illiterate person, for example. Like, are you saying that a, a prosecutor would not be able to prove a crime? If there's a crime, there should be some evidence. Of uh, course, and a lot of that, more and more of that evidence nowadays is digital, is my point. Okay, and with digital evidence, okay, if we are to apply the same principles, then encryption does thwart that in a way that things weren't thwarted earlier. Okay, in a way that a public prosecutor couldn't have said earlier for someone using, you know, uh, Rot 13 on a regular letter. Okay, it revealed to me what method of encryption you have used. Okay, in a way that that wasn't thwarted earlier. 
Mickey? I so, think about, so that's where I would take issue with you. I think you're wrong about that core assumption, which is that I believe, and I could be wrong, that actually there are people who had letters and they were not encrypted and they simply did not disclose them because they had a right against incriminating themselves. And because the court did not know that they existed, they could not force in a compulsory manner the disclosure of these letters. And people who were illiterate that committed crimes, they too presented a special challenge. And you're right, encryption does present a special challenge. But I don't think it's a new challenge. It's a challenge we have balanced throughout all of history, wherein <laughs> it's a challenge th where we've balanced throughout history where the public prosecutor has to find evidence of these crimes. So unless you're saying that all crimes are digital, that they're prosecuting, it seems to me like there'll be plenty of <laughs> physical world evidence. <laughs> So, I mean, I could be wrong, but I think that we'll see that this is the balance that's coming out. And encryption, for example, like off-the-record messaging, there is no key that you can disclose because it is a derived session key. This is just like when we used to have conversations where we were not recorded at all times. Does that present a threat to the public prosecutor? Or is that hard for the public prosecutor then? Yes, and we call that hearsay in courts. And that is something which we've finally been able to bring us back to. So what we see is not that cryptography takes us to a place we haven't been. It's actually that we see cryptography takes us to a place that we sometimes idealize, which is not necessarily a good thing to do. But it is this place where we used to have private ephemeral conversations, and now we can have them again. Then this is important, and this is actually positive. It is not a problem, in my opinion, that soon we will be able, and right now with off-the-record messaging and chatting, you can show that two people had a conversation, but you cannot show the content in a reliable, absolutely perfect way. This is not a new thing, though. This is, in fact, returning to a very age-old thing where we've finally been able to bring technology to the point of protecting us and bringing us to being able to have a free conversation that won't last for all time, and that is not a bad thing. That more and more things go in that way, in my mind, is actually good because it reduces the total amount of power that a state that is unaccountable and not transparent has. And it means that public prosecutions that are unjust will be more difficult. And that's actually a positive thing, in my opinion. And when physical crimes are committed in the real world, cryptography won't really significantly change it. And if we build a surveillance state and we backdoor these things, we will see that we don't have that in the real world anymore and we don't have it online anymore. And criminals will always be able to thwart it because they will understand how the system works. I know that when I want to take a sort of like free day and I'm feeling particularly surveilled, I do exactly what I suggested, which is if I had a cell phone, it takes a ride on a train, right? What data trail did I leave behind? Well, does that mean I'm a criminal? I don't know, but the point is that it helps me to feel better about the situation, and it also seems to be the case that if I were interested in a more serious crime, who wouldn't do that, right? I mean, it, people would do that, and they would say, oh, I left it on the train, whoops, I forgot about it. So all of the sabotage, all of the sort of undermining of our basic principles and liberty will still be beaten by someone who can just remember the difficult technological ability of leaving your phone somewhere. I mean, it's just, that to me is a fundamentally one where we should embrace encryption and we shouldn't say that it reduces our security societally. And when someone suggests that, we should ask for concrete, specific citations where a terrorist has used encryption and we actually couldn't break their communications. Because the FBI's wiretap report says encryption thwarted them zero times in 2010. Zero times. That includes me. I'm in those statistics. Fuck. But also, it seems to be evidence to the, to the contrary that encryption, in fact, is the primary thwarting thing, when in fact it just helps everybody in a wide sense until they become targeted. Pranesh looks very unconvinced. Uh, let's move on. We have a question in the second row, followed by this gentleman over here. Uh, please, uh, speak into the mic. Make it a brief and then pass the mic back there. You said, uh, give me an example where we introduced privacy and it caused this problem. Uh, I'm, I can think of one thing in recent things. Bitcoins, when they were introduced, okay, so the transactions on that were uh, anonymous. You They're not anonymous, but go on. Uh, okay, you, it may be hard to find it out, but the, uh, the, I think the Silk Road, which they called Black Market, on which they sold the weapons and the drugs, they were the ones who opted for the Bitcoin transactions. Mm -hmm. but, so but Bitcoin is not anonymous, but, but go okay. on. So you can trace bitcoins. I mean, the whole thing is a public log of all the transactions that have ever occurred. Yeah. So, I mean, I would never use bitcoins to buy drugs yeah, or weapons. I mean, not that I would buy drugs <laughs> or weapons, <laughs> but uh, okay, just but to be clear, right? I mean, 
so, but but the very fact that you are anonymous in that thing uh, uh, attracts more uh, people who would like to commit a crime than normal one. I, so would you say though that for example it is better that that used to be completely hidden and undercover and now you can see the scale of the problem and you can see how lame Silk Road is and you can see you're throwing all your civil liberties away because some guy with PHBB mm -hmm. and some Bitcoin mm -hmm. and a hidden service has like the ability to sell some shitty drugs. <laughs> I mean like who cares? It's, if anything, can you imagine how easy it is to infiltrate the network now where previously it was difficult? I mean, I'm not a big fan of law enforcement after what I have in, encountered in the last four years. But let's say that there are some legitimate law enforcement people. Somewhere I'm sure that there are. I don't really ever meet them, but let's say that they, <laughs> let's say that they I've met a few, to be fair, they, and they were very nice to me, which is probably why I think that, about them. But those people, right, are, in my opinion, by posting these things online, they actually open themselves up to infiltration. They open themselves up to selling drugs. They open themselves up you know, to like moving money and committing crimes in a way where now all of the world's police forces can actually stop them, in a sense. I would say that that's actually a good balance. If you were to get rid of anonymous communication, if you were to get rid of electronic currency, you might stop a few people from buying these things, but you wouldn't actually stop the core problem. You wouldn't even know about the core problem without infiltrating it and doing a similar thing. So it actually presents less risk to law enforcement to have it so easily accessible and to make it something where anyone can participate. And it presents more risk to people that are committing these crimes. And I think that that's something which nobody talks about, but I've talked with people from the DEA or from the FBI, and since they weren't giving me a hard time about WikiLeaks related stuff, I've said to them like, hey, so what about these things? Do you try to infiltrate them? And they're like, well, of course. And it gives me mixed feelings, because I don't want to help them, because I think the war on drugs is bullshit, right? It's a, it's cl yeah, because it's, class, it's class warfare, right? And the reality is that what, what Portugal has done has been very good. People decriminalizing drugs, solid, because it's about harm reduction. But let's say that you really believe in the war on drugs. It seems to me that anonymity helps you fight the war on drugs. And Bitcoin is not anonymous. Anybody using it to buy drugs is just, well, I mean, if they're also buying drugs, they may literally be smoking crack. <laughs> right? So we should consider this fact, right? But it's not, it's, it's like it's presented as a boogeyman, but let's be clear here, right? It's, it's not. What it is, is it's a challenge that requires law enforcement to learn. And I know that that's hard for a lot of police officers, but it's not impossible. And there are actually some that are quite smart that realize this trade-off. And while I don't particularly like it, I think that anonymity is for everyone. And that includes people who misbehave. And sometimes the misbehaving is a, is a bad guy, we, we, you know, or like whatever boogeyman in society. And uh, that boogeyman really reaches people, right? Like in the West, it's about child pornography and terrorism and drugs and money laundering. And in, like, let's say in the Middle East, it's about offense about religion, not always, but sometimes. Or it's about speaking out against your leaders, not always, but sometimes. And in China, it's often about politics. And we, we saw that in the case of Xi Tao, right? A single IP address put him in prison for 10 years thanks to Yahoo and their pile of blood money. And, you know, anonymity can be very powerful in helping people that are otherwise not very powerful. But it's when there is a targeted attack against, en you know, entities like drug dealers, for example, anonymity won't protect you forever. There are going to be attacks that are social in nature, even with strong crypto. Right? So the thing that, that crypto and anonymity can help with is dragnet surveillance. But ultimately, like, when someone installs malware like FinFisher on your telephone, no amount of encryption is going to stop FinFisher from working, really. I mean, once you've typed in your passphrase and the keys are in memory, it's going to extract it and, and, and you know, snitch you out. Right? So it's not a panacea, but it does help scale communications in a way that are secure. And, and I think that this is an important thing. I don't sell it as a panacea. I'm not selling it at all. I'm just suggesting that if we... If we use this stuff, it can really help us and it can really protect us at a societal scale. Individually, we'll be back to the point that we were before, which is fighting these things at a, at a much different level. And I think in really to successfully fight these things, we have to learn. And so the war on drugs, we should end it. That's, that's, that's the solution to problems about drugs, is regulating it and keeping people safe and reducing harm. And the problem of money laundering is probably similar, so that we should make sure that people have the ability to freely communicate and to share their own wealth. I mean, we talk about this in the Cypherpunks book. And Bitcoin does present a threat to some people that wish to control um, wealth and to track it. But boy, it is not anonymous. And so it, you know, keep that in mind. If you think you get anonymity properties from it, you probably don't get the ones you think you do. And certainly, you should be careful about whether or not that's something you 
really, really neat. And so it doesn't really, to me, that's not a concrete point in favor of these things uh, changing the landscape too much, except that it brings us back to a place where due process and, uh, and the rest of the things we actually like in our society are actually required. They're required, right? Because it used to be you could just grab it, and now you have to, again, ask for permission. You have to talk to a person. You have to question them and ask them these, these questions. That's like, I actually you know, think that that's a much better idea because it scales much, uh, you know, much like you would expect it to. So it doesn't scale very well at all. And that's really important because if you have a government that can watch over all of you at the same time, it scales really well and it has the ability to, for example, revoke your visa automatically or stop you at a border automatically and do these things that can be very seriously misused. And if it happens at a smaller scale, you can still have those kinds of controls. It's just really hard to do it automatically and at like a billion people scale, for example. Uh, can we have the next question? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask was, uh, since uh, you know you have been caught by the government and you just said that you know FBI, uh, no sorry, not caught but probed, <laughs> allegedly. And then uh, you said that uh, FBI reads your emails and at a scale that you use encryption, so where do you see uh, the masses using encryption and the utopia you talked about? Is it that we shun the communication that we use or uh, probably, you know, because encryption these days, I don't think so it's coming much to use because, you know, still people are getting caught uh, over the encrypted network. So, so where do you uh, see this going, the encryption and the utopia you talked about? Well, I mean, I'll be, I'll be brief because this is an easy one, which is to say that I chose a bunch of services like Twitter, Gmail, um, my ISP or whatever, and I paid for them in traceable ways. And I did that because I knew the US government was coming for me. Okay, first of all. Second of all, I did that so that all of you would have an example about how they will come for you. Okay? And third of all, I take issue with your word caught. <laughs> and probe. Surely there will be something in that to hang me. There's no question, right? And this is the battle, right? What happens to Bradley Manning and what happens to Julian is probably what will happen to me and to many other people, right? Because this is a witch hunt. So what is the solution to a witch hunt? It is a free and open and just society. That's not even a utopia. I just want due process. I just want to be able to confront my accusers to have evidence laid out in front of me that I can examine. This is not really much of a utopia. And so I think that strong encryption actually does help me from being targeted in things that I didn't choose to be surveilled, as an example. And I think that that works really well. And I think things like off-the-record messaging, plus Tor, plus SSL and TLS, these things are actually often used by lots of people. And any time you've ever gone online and bought something and you saw a little padlock and you successfully did that, every time you use encryption, you know, this war on privacy, you're winning it a little bit. I mean, to paraphrase Bill Hicks, right? He said, did you hear there's a war on drugs and every time you're high, you're winning it? <laughs> right? right? <laughs> it's not my joke, but I think the same thing is true for encryption. And so we can't say that encryption doesn't work. It's just that encryption buys you time. That's all it does. It just buys you time. Sometimes the amount of time it buys you is the amount of time you need. Sometimes it doesn't buy you enough time. And obviously, sometimes encryption isn't the problem because the metadata about you is the problem. Right? Who you talk to is the thing that someone is after. So these things can help you, I think. And I think it's worth considering using them. I also think the real thing we need to do is actually use the internet with this in mind, but then change our society with these things in mind. And we'll find some balance between my utopian crypto anarchy and you know, totalitarian fascism. But where we find that, and what kind of balance, and how we find that, is up to you guys. It's not my country. Right? I like to come and visit, but it's up to you to decide that. And so even though we might lose some of these things some of the time, you can protect yourself some of the time, and against many people. If you use strong crypto in this room, probably nobody can break it. It doesn't mean that we're losing just because sometimes some intelligence agencies can break it. We should do it. We should do it anyway. And we should make it as hard as possible for people that wish to spy on us because they are spies. You know, I, you know, I once met a guy, he said back in the day, men were men and spies were spies and they didn't ask for permission to spy and whine when they couldn't. <laughs> Sounds great. I want that day back too. Um, the point which you kept up regarding the uh, centralized database or the UID which we are implementing, 
By that we are preparing an attack surface where bad guys or say someone can actually find all the data about people and uh, get uh, just to if they can have access to that data they have all the data. In the similar uh, perspective or say in, in the similar pa uh, way I, want, I wanted like if you are creating a strong encryption say the creators of that particular encryption and um, the law and enforcement agencies or the uh, FBI say any uh, governments uh, ask uh, they would be now knowing that these are the creators of the uh, of this particular encryption which is being used uh -huh. so they can force them uh, what can be the thing uh, they can just now go to them itself and ask for the uh, decryption or decryption algorithm something kind of that so again now aren't we creating a, a surface for yeah, yeah, you're these right guys? you're right you're right I totally I understand the question I'll restate it more succinctly which is if we build centralization into systems of spying we add attack service this is another way of saying that when we when we uh, build a central system we have a place where someone can go to get this information previously they had to go to a billion people and take their fingerprints now they go to a database and pull it out this is attack surface for the fingerprint database let's say that's true you you do create that attack service and in fact you still have the old attack service and now you have the new attack service okay the thing is with crypto when we build these things as free software first of all you can inspect the source code if you have a developer or a programmer nearby or if you are one right the second thing is that it is the ideas of encryption that really matter, not the particular implementation. This is very important, right? So if you understand how Tor works, you can build a client that is your own if you wish to. Some people have, in fact, done this. There are multiple implementations of Tor because they don't want to trust us. But the final point you make, which is that they can force us, this is the difference between at least me and some other people, I think. And maybe it's because I don't have children, or maybe it's because I'm like genetically bred to be very fearful, but go on anyway. Who knows, right? You always have a choice. And so when you choose to be a rat fink motherfucker and sell people out and to harm them, never say that you were forced. Always remember that you had a choice. And that is, in fact, the most important thing and why we must have diversity, so that these are not centralized points. If there was only one encryption product, obviously would be a huge target. But when there are a million encryption products, and some of them are okay and some of them are you know, not so okay, we see that this attack service still exists, but it's spread out everywhere. At some point, we'll have to change the tactic. And in fact, we've seen that. Finn Fisher tries to break into your computer instead of going after Skype. Instead of going and getting things from Skype, they take a different, you know, they're hacking, right? So they take a different angle, and it works. And so it does present some kind of centralization. But there are different ways to attack it. But similarly, even if the Zeta cartel from Mexico were to come and say, hey, do this thing, we must build systems that when you comply, because you will comply, you cannot harm people. So I have some, like, for example, I can push source code to various different Tor-related projects, um, although not core Tor, because I have some other people that review it. They review it because they've started the project, and they, they really do that. We look at the source code that they review. We, we peer review these things. If someone were to come to me and try to force me to do it, we've even compartmentalized the structure such that even if you could force me to write the code or assert that I had written it, someone else has to sign off on it. And even if you could force them to merge the code, well, the whole world would see that that code was merged. And I think it would be very hard to get people to do that willingly in a legal situation. The Zeta cartel obviously does present a real threat when we have those kinds of things, when they're willing to like kill you or your family or something. And in that case, I would at least understand the choice you made, but I would never deny that there was a choice. And so we must always categorically refuse to build so-called lawful interception, and we must categorically refuse to put in backdoors, and we should always do our development in the open, and we should make it free software so people can review it, and we should have open specifications so that people understand that if someone did come to us and some change happened, they would understand why the change happened. This is huge and very important to do that, and that allows us to retain our choice as long as possible. And when someone comes and tries to force us, it will give us the maximum amount of agency to stop and to resist it. And hopefully, if we have enough people working on this, there'll be just too many people to try to compromise to make that a feasible strategy. And instead, I think other strategies will be attempted. And I could be wrong, but I think that that's the right way to do it. And the true crypt people seem to do a very good job of this in that they don't even let their identities be known. They are a cryptographic key, right? And so they try to head that off. So it would be very hard I don't know if they use Tor or not, but I would suspect that they do. And I would suspect that what that means is that you can't even go to them to try to force them. 
And so you can build projects like that because yes, it does increase the attack surface, but it doesn't mean that it's therefore we should give up. It just means we have to look at those edges and we have to see that that's a much better attack surface than everything being unencrypted, for example, or not understanding about cryptography at all. Uh, okay. <laughs> cool. Thanks. As you just said, oh. uh, to build a individual crypto or say ask many people to build a crypto algorithm or build the encryption, for a public service like uh, any public service into which is being used by many people say Skype uh, take an example of Skype some previous uh, couple of years uh, before Skype di was uh, did not allow Indian government to access the decryption algorithm uh, but other governments uh, like US was allowed for it so in that case is it again it a uh, concentration of uh, say allow allowing um, to decrypt uh, the uh, the encryption or say uh, in how would it be if it's a public service uh, the encryption is again for a uh, with that particular public service well there's something to be said about Skype right Skype is closed source malware in my opinion <laughs> right and it's and and if we look we see that when you pass a URL through Skype that Microsoft actually takes the URL from your private chat messages and scans it by like hitting the web server so between two people when you're talking, Microsoft somehow is in the picture and they go to the URL you've privately passed. So if you passed a company sensitive URL through that, Microsoft now knows about it and maybe they index it, who knows, but they literally visit that URL. Even if you have never visited it, no one has ever visited it. Don't use systems like that, right? That's, that is a really important point. Build alternative systems. Build the Skype of today that doesn't sell out its users. Like for example, RIM. Right? When the Indian government pressured RIM, what did they do? They bent over. Because for them, expanding the market share in capitalism was more important than considering that you are a human being that has privacy rights and that you deserve to understand what happens with your data and who gets to see it. Well, that's because RIM considers the carriers and the countries to be the customers and not the end user that carries the telephone. And this is wrong. And so we should replace RIM because they have betrayed us. <coughs> Same with Skype. Uh, the gentleman in the first row. Uh, hey, so uh, we we had a debate earlier over here uh, about uh, the balance between liberty and you know security. So can uh, data or a data doppelganger be really admitted as concrete evidence? Can't it be classified or there should be a debate on this matter, don't you think so? How much effort has been taken to engage with uh, legal structures across the democratic world to decide where do we stand on this issue? Do we really consider you know a data footprint to be concrete given the fact that Attribution is so difficult. <coughs> sorry, so difficult in internet networks. Yes. So, has there been you know effort engaged across the world to discuss this? Yes, absolutely. Yes, there has. And in the case of the Twitter case against me, for example, that's USA v. Applebaum, we lost. Right? We lost the ability to even fight. In fact, and in the future, we don't really even get to fight about whether or not they get the data. They say that metadata, which data metadata in aggregate, right, tells tells a story which is sometimes richer than the content of your communications. But in this case, what we found was that, um, frankly, they think that it's perfect. There's no question about whether or not the IP address I logged into Twitter is solid. They just assume that because they got it from Twitter that it's great. There's no review of Twitter's logging system. So I think it's probably possible that you could, for example, insert false logging data and it would be introduced into court as evidence. And in fact, it may be the case that they can get this data from the company without you even knowing it. So you would not even know to review the company's logging procedure. And yes, they will use that as evidence. And in fact, they wish to use that as evidence against me to hang me, literally under the Espionage Act in my country, which carries the death penalty. So that's the debate in democratic West countries, right? And we lost, right? And we lost just a couple months ago in the USA v. Applebaum case. And you know, it sucks to be a loser, but hey, it's, it's a good example. Don't be me. I suppose is the example, but also recognize who they are, who are the players and what they're doing. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's terrifying stuff. And the reality is that people believe machines to be perfect. And so whatever a machine has said, it's like electronic voting. What's the vote? Oh, 39 against one. Let's do a recount, 39 against one. How about now? Still 39 against one. Damn. That's really terrible. And that's pretty much what we've seen happening here. I think there'll be some really good lawyers that will argue against it in some cases. I'll say, well, yeah, that's not true. 
And then there'll be some debate about it. But now you'll have to prove your innocence again. Because they'll say, well, we have this data. Prove another alibi. It's like, oh yeah, someone stole my phone. Prove it. Did you file a police report? Prove it. It seems to fit the pattern. You were normally walking this way. Are you sure that you didn't do that again? Right? And, and so it flips it. And that's the really scary part. Does that debate basically happen without anybody looking? I deal with data every day. I'm an analyst. And sometimes, often a lot, I'm pretty horrified. Yeah, so in Qatar, I once uh, encountered their, uh, their censorship and surveillance system. And I found out that if you visit certain websites, it gives you like a little picture. It's like, oops. This page is not available, and it has some like smiling guys from Qatar, you know, and they've got like poofy hair, and they're like, ha ha ha, you know. So sorry about that, right? And I noticed that when I went to this website, which was for uh, an industrial film company I used to work at, let's say, uh, that it blocked me, and then it redirected me to a site that logged this data, and it logged my IP address, and it logged the site I had gone to. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. So I put in some IP addresses of systems that I thought were interesting in Qatar, like police and other places. And I just like filled their log file such that they had all gone to the same site that was blocked too. Why not? <laughs> Who's going to argue about being innocent better than them? Right? So I thought that would be useful. I mean, and also on that trip, a weird thing happened. Like someone broke into my hotel room and the hotel was like, you know, oh, we didn't enter your room without your permission. And I said, yes, but someone did. And they said, sir, no one enters your hotel room from the cleaning staff without permission. I said, well, I didn't give you permission. They said, no one from the cleaning staff. <laughs> All right, great. Maybe I should. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, who knows? That was kind of interesting. But I guess the point is that that kind of, that kind of stuff is clear, and it will become more clear how unjust it is over time. What we must try to do is avoid that injustice from the onset. We should know these things before we learn them the hard way, that sometimes data lies. We should also know these things don't tell the picture that the prosecutor wants just because they have individual facts. It used to be a little bit more like that, I think, in some cases. But even then, it's still quite dangerous. And we're talking about very serious, severe penalties in some cases. Like I have um, some FOIAs which show that my coworker, Roger, had purchased an airplane ticket for me for work reasons. It logged the IP address he bought it from, the credit card number, it logged his name, it logged my name, it logged the flight information, and it tied it all together. And when I FOIA'd it, I got his credit card. So I had his credit card. Right? And they logged it all. And the crazy part is that he only dealt with the flight company. And I got this data from the Customs and Border Protection. So the corporation that sold him the plane ticket gave it to the government, and the government gave it to me. So I told him, hey, you should cancel your credit card. I have this. Sorry. And then I asked him to buy me another plane ticket, and he did, because he was very gracious. <laughs> right? Because it was for work. But I mean, that was a great example, right? Like, it looks like Roger concretely bought me a plane ticket. But how do we know that Roger did that? I mean, it also could have been the case that it wasn't Roger that bought the plane ticket. It could have been someone else using Roger's credit card. We have lawmakers who aren't, you know, in tune with uh, a lot of the stuff that has been invented since 1960. <laughs> um, the 18th. You know, you know, in America, we have this problem, too. It's uh, male, uh, generally um, senators and congressmen. They, they talk about like women's bodies and how they work. And you see this all the time. They're like, oh, yeah, you know, absolutely. This is what we should do about legislating women's choices. So you see the same thing, right? These guys don't understand women's bodies at all, and they legislate about that all the time. Why would it be different with technology? Now everybody gets to do it, right? <laughs> it's unfortunate, and that's a reality. So you should kick them out and take their place. <laughs> we have a question back here. Hi, uh, is it okay if I ask two questions? Next classes. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> uh, you too. Anyway, so uh, well, the first one is about Silk Road. I think it's really problematic to speak about it as the dark web because uh, I don't know about the weapons and I don't know how many people will be buying weapons because, like you said, uh, Bitcoin is pseudo anonymous. But uh, with drugs, I think any statement, like you said, about getting high, it's, it's actually a political statement where. Uh, the usage of drug itself is not the problem, it's the involvement of um, the mafia or the cartels, which is the problem. And Silk Road sort of uh, does away with that. Uh, so in that, uh, so with respect to Silk Road, I think it was compromised uh, some time back. And since Todd hosts it, I want to just ask you, like, uh, well, how Tor doesn't host Silk Road. We should be clear. I'll explain something about Tor, which I didn't, which is Tor has this idea. It's, uh, it's uh, Tor Hidden Services. Tor Hidden Services are a way for you to have... Um, an address where someone can reach you and to connect to your computer and 
when you want to publish that, like it's a, it's a long cryptographic hash, which is really hard to remember, which is 80 bits in length, and it ends in .onion, so it's a pseudo TLD, so to speak. And it's not like an easy to remember name because it's in Zuko's triangle, you can only have a couple of properties. There are three possible properties, and we have chosen the one where it's globally unique and secure, and that means you don't get the easy human memorable name. And so Silk Road set up a Tor hidden service. We have nothing to do with them. We do not host them. They are just another anonymous user of the Tor network. And it's very important to draw this distinction because I, if I ran a service like that, will I have particular feelings about the war on drugs? There's no way I'd fucking touch that. That's really dangerous. So I don't know anything about them being compromised. I don't know anything about who runs it or anything like that, and I don't want to know. In fact, that's why I want an anonymity system so that people can do those things and I don't have to be near them and I can have anonymity and we can be completely separate and I can be left alone, hopefully. Right? It's really important that that's the case. So Tor does not host Silk Road and that's really important. And whether or not they're compromised, I have no idea. But I would imagine that if all of the governments in the world were working on compromising it, it would be quite an amusing law enforcement operation in that you'll probably see like Dutch police, which I know do this kind of thing, um, like breaking into computer systems and infiltrating them, they're probably going to be social engineering like American FBI agents, right, anonymously. Like, hey, do you want to buy some drugs? <laughs> yeah, I want to buy some drugs, right? And you know you're going to see that kind of thing. So at some point, though, this is sort of like the Stasi, you know, where you have this, like, oh, we finally got this guy. You know, he's like a really interesting guy. He's got all, he seems to be able to get away with anything. And then it turns out they're arresting another cop, right? <laughs> I mean... I wouldn't be surprised if things like that happen, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was entirely filled with cops. But who knows? It's really hard to know. And I think there are some interesting studies to be done there, and I try to stay as far away from that as I can because it's super duper dangerous, and who buys their drugs with Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. I'm surprised a lot of people do. But, um, I mean, um, I'm in India. There's a drugstore down the street. <laughs> right? You guys make fantastic drugs. <laughs> it's all, and it's all legal. Pay with rupees. It's better than Bitcoin, actually, <laughs> but only in some ways. Yeah, I think that's like another conversation altogether. But okay, so that I'll just come to my second. It's more like a comment. So I have a problem with your usage of the term informed consent. Mm. Uh, I'm not a techie. I'm a law student. I'm a lawyer, and. Um, so the thing is, uh, well, informed consent, I think, was most popularized with the uh, medical negligence cases. And then we saw this happening, that like what you spoke about with Obama's comments on um, the drone attacks, uh, like so neoliberalism or whatever you want to use, technocracy, neoconservatism. So that sort of works in a subtle way where it uh, sort of presents the opposite of what it's doing, like what Obama said with the drone uh, attacks, like something like what Marxist, Mar like the Marxist concept of the freedom of choice, like not actually being freedom at all so uh, yeah so now the problem with informed consent is that uh, you may know the information that is required to make that consent and I may know it but the layman doesn't actually know it and there is no way to get it to them so is it even possible to make an informed consent and how informed should consent be for it to be informed consent like you use it and so uh, I mean I think there's an oversimplification of the term like with the way you use it and I think it's really problematic with the kind of stuff that you're saying to do that yeah. well, I, so I agree it's really difficult to have informed consent, but I think that that's a standard we should shoot for. For example, when people legislate about technology and want to put in back doors, but they don't understand the unintended consequences, I think that it's really ridiculous to say, therefore, when they spy with these things, that it's legitimate because their power is legitimate, and their power is legitimate because we consent to their power, and we consent to them making these decisions that they don't know a damn thing about. And so, yes, obviously it is the case that you know informed consent about subtle things is very difficult. But we should be aiming for that kind of thing. For example, you should be told the side effects of a medical treatment before you undergo it. You should understand the probabilities. This suggests, though, that education is a fundamental human right. And I would say that that is important, because if you don't understand probabilities and statistics, if you don't understand what it means to be one in a million and what death is when there are side effects to those medical procedures, for example, it's hard to argue that you do have informed consent, obviously. But I would say that there isn't really an alternative. Like, there isn't a better model where we can say that, you know, you shouldn't be given that choice. You shouldn't have that data. You shouldn't learn about those things. You should just be told what to do, for example. This is the flip side of informed consent, is that you don't get to consent to things at all. Or you get to consent without being informed. And I, I feel like, 
I don't want to be over there, and I know it's really hard to get over to informed consent. So for some things, like for example wiretapping, we can try to solve this problem in a way where we don't need people to understand the nuances of what it means to be secure in a world where everything is actually insecure except when the law says otherwise. That I would just rather move towards a thing where we can say, as best as we know, through strong mathematics, it is secure. Do you want to make this phone call? That's a much easier thing, as opposed to, unless someone sits outside with an MC catcher, unless someone is recording it, you're secure unless someone wants you to not be secure. Like, I feel like this requires much more of an education. And so when we want to move towards an informed consent model, we should also work towards actually doing the things we say that we're doing and making sure that people understand it. And I know that that's an uphill battle. And obviously, like, I think a great example of informed consent is about consenting with regard to sexuality. You never know that the person you're going to sleep with is actually an asshole. Right? But you should hope that they are tested and that they're safe. And that's the best you can do is that you can try to have an open and honest dialogue, and you can try to protect yourself. But you may find out later that they were duplicitous, or that they're kind of a jerk, or that they're secretly racist, or that they're not secretly racist, whatever, right? And I still think it's better to try to move in a direction of informed consent where people are open and honest about these things than the alternatives, and more so than what we have now. And I agree that it's problematic, and it is very hard. But I don't see an alternative we could present other than informed consent where people may make choices that I wouldn't make, but at least we can say that they have thought about them when they had an opportunity to think about it, and at least it wasn't being forced upon them. And you see this with genetic testing, you see it with things relating to drugs and sex and rock and roll, right? I mean, it's all over the place. And I still think it's, it's, a, it's a much better thing, even though it is problematic. But, but ultimately that's because I think liberty is problematic, right? I mean, it is very, very problematic to give and to ensure that people have choices, uh, especially when there are unintended unknown consequences, for example. So we should try to like get rid of those unintended consequences whenever possible. And I realize that m many of these things are not achievable probably even in my lifetime, but it's still, I think, uh, worth working towards. So I don't know if that satisfies you, but I really hope that it does. Are you saying that people were not informed about the concept of informed consent? <laughs> <laughs> Shit, you got me. Yeah, okay, well, I mean, there you go. I mean, I'm sorry to do it later. There are five people that left and they missed out, but everybody else clear on that? It's very, very controversial, oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, are there, are there any other questions? Is if there? Uh, <laughs> in back. No, there was, uh, I'm sorry, the gentleman? The woman in back? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, how many more questions? How about we just, take? everybody that wants to raise a question, uh, raise your hand. I was told we have the space till 10, but I don't think I can stand here for that long. I'm not going to sit down either. That's, well, maybe I might. It's up to you. Hey, you guys, you, yeah, I'll try to be quick. So, try to ask questions that elicit a one word answer. We'll get more questions. Speaking. I just have a uh, couple of questions. Um, one, uh, you've been talking about uh, the um, uh, encryption as such as a, as, as a, as a measure of uh, securing your own communication as well as your uh, data. Um, how foolproof do you think that your uh, encryption is, number one? And number two, how do you even know that um, you know uh, law enforcement agencies or someone who wants to spy on you are not decrypting your data already? And you're not knowing it. Oh yeah, that's actually great. That's easy. Okay, so there's a peer-reviewed, open scientific community about cryptography that, that, that talks about cryptography and that works on it. And I'm a part of this community in a very minor way. And I read the literature and I feel pretty strong about the systems we've built. I don't think they're perfect. There's a thing we call the 100-year crypto problem. I'm like migrating to sitting down partially here. So I'm a little tired. Um, so awkwardly. It's like, anyway, so... That, I feel pretty good about the fact that it works today. I don't think that it works for 100 years in the sense that in 100 years there can be a lot of changes. And 100 years ago the crypto was pretty bad. Right? Yes. So this... Well, like for example, if you're using... Sure, so if you're using BlackBerry Instant Messenger, for example, or RIM products, like it's not good enough for five seconds. <laughs> right? 
and, and don't use it. It's not safe, in my opinion, and I think probably it's pretty bad. But for the actual encryption algorithms that are used in Tor, for example, these are like cutting edge, public, uh, reviewed crypto systems, and we put them into Tor in a way that we think is secure. And the thing is that we don't know. We don't know for sure. And so the idea is that we publish them openly and in a peer reviewed sense in hopes that people that are much smarter than us, and that's a lot of people, especially when they're all together working on it, uh, that they'll be able to tell us if it's okay. And so that's why I'm also not saying it's perfect. I'm just saying that it makes it a lot harder. Right? And, and, and I think that's worth doing. And the second part, how do I know? I'm certain that everything I do is compromised. Right? It's because I've been told by people in the US government that they're going to like do awful things to me. Right? And one of the awful techniques that they have is human infiltration of your life. No cryptography presents, uh, let's say, uh, a problem to a tyrannical organization that will put a person, like for example, in the United Kingdom, there's a man named Mark. Mark is best known for infiltrating an environmental group and for six years pretended to be an environmental activist, including falling in love with a woman in that group. And then one day, it turns out he's a cop. Right? So no encryption, no, like no encryption or decryption process is necessary for that kind of infiltration. And so do I think that I'm being spied upon? Well, if the largest U.S. law enforcement investigation in history is a measure, they did it for much lesser people, I suppose they might do it for me as well. And so I'm pretty sure that it's happening, but I'm still going to make it as hard as possible. And that way, when evidence comes out, I'll be able to see how they broke the systems and where they broke them. And hopefully people will learn from it. And I hope that I can do a little more than just serve as an example. A little, a little bit, but I don't think that they would attack me through crypto systems. I think they would attack me through human systems and through human weaknesses, and they would probably win. And that's why society has to ensure that things like that don't actually happen to, for example, investigative journalists or people that are effective activists or people that wish to have free association. Um, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that it, it's very hard to know if they've broken the crypto otherwise. Can we, please, uh, I'm sorry, can we move on and uh, ask? You can talk to me later about it. Sure. I'm not saying that there is a honey trap or there isn't a honey trap. Just as a really bad joke, but. Yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, I like my partner, for example, woke up with two dudes with night vision goggles watching her sleep in the middle of the night in her bedroom. That, that's an example of like a really serious chilling effect on my free speech and hers, right? She woke up and there's a guy with night vision goggles watching her sleep in her bedroom. Yeah, that's the FBI. <laughs> but, but, but it's not a joke. That's serious stuff that really happens, and that has a chilling effect. So the point is, though, that they also break into computer systems and so on. And th the thing is that your country is building the same set of capacity right now electronically, and they already have some of this phys physically, and we should probably make sure that things like that are considered an affront to justice and that the rule of law does not allow it. Because if the rule of law, a law allows that, what is the point of the rule of law? It just seems like the rule of arbitrary and capricious men to me. Uh, my question is uh, changing from a uh, private uh, surveillance system to an anonymity system is a big change all over the globe if you consider it, right? So if you turn the system in this way, will it be sustainable? Will it survive in this way? Is there any way we can conclude that it is actually workable and it is practical to have a system like that and still it will survive and it will not create more problems than we have right now? Um, well, I have no idea. Let's try. So I is there any place in the world where it, uh, uh, we have a system like this where it's anonymous and it's still there, properly system working? Well, the Tor network exists today and you can use it and people are using it and society hasn't yet broken down into complete chaos. I mean, I don't know if do you mean is there a full society? I mean, the Venetian society had anonymity as a part of its uh, democracy and that was a very strong thing until they became crony capitalists. And so it was crony capitalism that destroyed Venetian society and not anonymity. Anonymity, in fact, is one of the strong fundamental aspects that allowed Venetian society to grow quite um, to a strong point. I think that was the 15th century in Venice. Um, so, I mean, there are examples throughout history of places where strong anonymity is, is available. I mean, you can look through it. It's really hard to know what success means, though, right? If you live your life without oppression, <coughs> For example, is that success? If you only live half your life without a depression, is that success? I don't know. But uh, I think the thing is that we should try to get rid of surveillance because we live for almost all of human history without total society-wide surveillance. That's a huge shift. 
And that's a huge expansion. We should reject that expansion, especially when it happens non-democratically. And then additionally, we should make sure that strong cryptography at least makes it extremely difficult, if not impossible, for that to happen again. And, and that, I don't think, is going to make us break down into like a, you know, a chaotic nightmare situation. Uh, one more thing. Uh, do you no? Um, <laughs> so first, I, I wanted to thank you uh, with respect to your comments about uh, the Canadian gun registry. Um, I'm, ca <laughs> I'm Canadian uh, and have argued vehemently for the Canadian gun re registry in the past. Um, and I've never, prior to tonight, envisioned a bunch of militant vegetarians assassinating duck hunters across can Canada because they'd tapped into that database. Um, <laughs> so... Why do uh, they have to be vegetarian? <laughs> they don't have to be vegetarian, but as I'm progressing towards vegetarian, the thought enters my mind. So. Isn't India the best place? <laughs> it's, the best, it's the best place to be a vegetarian in the world. It's the only place where you don't have to say you're sorry for being a vegetarian, and meat eaters have to suck it up. It's pretty much the only place in the so world where the vegetarian food doesn't actually taste like crap. So, um, it, is, it is delicious. But um, <laughs> So my question is, uh, you, you spoke at the very beginning about um, your utopian vision. Uh, and this, this will be short, I really promise. Um, so I, I, am <laughs> <laughs> I am probably a Taoist, and so maybe my utopian vision would be to return to a society where the tying of ropes is how unspoken communication happens. Um, I'm curious what your elevator pitch is for a utopian society in your mind, sans uh, maybe cryptography and due process, which seems like incremental steps toward that thing. I mean, my, my utopian society is an anarchist society where we decide uh, these things in a democratic way, right? Anarchism as in Balkunin and Emma Goldman, not anarchism as in, uh, you know, uh, George Bush and everything will be anarchy, right? I mean, really like philosophical anarchism where we recognize fundamental human rights. So this is sort of a preference-based utilitarianism where we can make decisions about our life and we choose to do these things in a way, you know, that we choose, say, like, and it might impact other people, and when it impacts those other people, we ask them, and if it would harm them, maybe we don't do that, and maybe we make sure that we come up with structures that we regularly regenerate in order to make sure that they don't sort of accumulate power and accumulate hereditary power at that. Um, that, I think, could provide a basis for us to build something else. So I don't have a prescriptive suggestion other than some very base rules, like letting people live their life without forcing them to do things and coercing them. I mean, there's, a, there's a city, it's called Christiania. It's uh, in the heart of Copenhagen, and it's in the only anarchist-free zone in the whole world, and it's far from perfect. It has about, eight, I think, seven or 800 families, and they occupied a military base in the 70s, and it still exists today. And they're an anarchy that has four or five rules, like no hard drugs, no bulletproof vests, no weapons, like really like completely simple things. And they all come together once a week or once a month, and they decide issues in their community by discussing it with their neighbors. And they agree by consensus on the solution so that people don't get bowled over, have their property taken with, uh, without uh, really like a lot of debate. And it is really awesome. It's like the exact opposite of North Korea, right? And that, in my sense, Christiania is, is a really good idea, and I think that uh, I, would, I, I don't know that I would want to live there since I'm not Danish and I don't speak Danish, um, but it seems like that is a lot closer and uh, to what I'd like to see. And I think there are some problems with it, but from that you can get to other places in a way where you don't sort of like step on other people in order to get there and you don't force other people in order to get there. And, you know, there's a, there's a great book. It's uh, Fragments of an Anarchist Anthropology and it sort of talks about anarchism as a political movement and about these ideas, you know, of libertarian ideology, I guess you could say. And I think that there's, there's really quite a lot to be studied there and to be debated. At the same time, I also see that the rule of law, when it is actually democratic, has a lot of power. And it is important and can protect, for example, minorities that would be, let's say, put down you know, in a bad way in a consensus-based discussion. So I think there's some debate about it. So at the core, you could just say that I think there should be debate where we can achieve consensus about what we wish to do next. And then every couple of generations, we should probably change it. And in fact, Thomas Jefferson sort of suggested this too. He said that every person should have a seat at the table when practically possible. And that's sort of like my idea of a utopia, right? And from there, you might want a wiretapping 
spy society that infiltrates, you know, relationships, for example, that that one is not sustainable, right? In anthropology, we in fact see, um, and in sociology, that like groups that are friendly and open and giving, they tend to last longer. And I think that that's a big rambling fucking mess of a reply, but I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, you guys are probably like, if I'm sweating, you must really be sweating. Your legs are falling asleep or something. Perhaps we should wrap up here, yeah? and you could take yeah, I mean, uh, if, I these mean, if, questions. If anybody's later. really dying to ask me a question, I know that this is the you know this is an important thing which can help people. But if people really want to go, stand up and get out. That's uh, and I think you should do that, right? So, um, you know, any? No. Sorry for everyone that if you really want to go, you should just start leaving, and it'll it'll naturally. Okay, uh, this is a very specific question regarding India. Okay, you have the UID system. The need for the UID system was because there, in other systems, there are a lot of duplicates. So they wanted one system where they wouldn't have duplicates of people where a single person would exist as a single person. Okay, uh, now suppose you don't want to have this uh, bundle of data in one place. Okay, which would probably, you, you mentioned the problems of that. Okay, then probably you could remove some data from it. Like you could have only your biometrics proving that you're a citizen of the country uh -huh. and just a card and the only thing that it has is your biometrics proving that you and they have data of your biometrics not linking it to anything else sure. but then you will need at other places to prove something else like for example now uh, you're applying to a college uh, which has say 33 percent reservation for women for example and you need to prove that you're a woman <laughs> okay and it's a, it's an online application I'm saying and the only way you can do it is you'll put your uh, that card number, but then that doesn't have any data. So sometimes you'll need some particular data. So what's your question? No, the question is, do you have any uh, alternative in mind where, see, for example, you work for the uh, for Ecuador in their uh, uh, you know electoral system. So d did you implement something over there that probably uh, kept them safer? So is your question, how is it that India survived all the way to this time and had universities without the UID system? <laughs> Could I rephrase your question that way? Because I mean, I think that the alternative system is one which does not require a total surveillance state where you centralize all of that information and then force you to share it with third parties where you don't have auditing systems and also on top of it, you're forced to comply with it. And if you don't want to be in a free society, you don't get to be in that database. And therefore, if you're not in the database, you don't get to be a member of a free society. Is that about sum it up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my solution is maybe to try to stay free, right? My solution is to try to build systems where you, you know, actually don't need to build all of that in order to prove that you're a woman. There's another solution for that. <laughs> there are many solutions for proving, <laughs> proving that, in fact. And I, <laughs> I don't know, it just seems a little bit weird. Like, I just don't believe that the balance is there. And I can imagine that you can build like a, a David Chalmers, one of my favorite people to ever live in terms of the things he, he has invented. And so I can imagine you can build a system, and in fact I know these things have been built, where you have an electronic ID card and you can prove just a certain property about yourself and only that property, and you can reveal that thing to a selective party, and it's not centralized, let's say. Um, I can't remember the name of the system I saw, but the Canadians have a thing. It's called proportional ID. And the idea is you have an ID card and you reveal certain parts. So if you need to show, for example, uh, Andrew Clement from the University of Toronto's proportional ID thing. It's great. It's uh, some cutouts of like paper and you put it over your ID and you flip to the page where you need to show your age. And so you show the, the cutout where it shows your birthday or you need to show your gender. So it just is a cutout of that. And then maybe you also have to show a picture. So you show the picture as well. And then when you show this to a bouncer at a nightclub or you show it to like a person writing you a ticket, you know, you reveal the thing that by law you need to reveal but nothing else. Um, to do that his way, he's of course hacking a normal Canadian ID card where they have all that information in a central database. So imagine you have the same thing but no central database. And imagine you use cryptography instead of cutouts of paper. You could probably build something like that. That's not the UID system as far as I can tell. And it sounds like what you're saying is that would be really useful. So what I would suggest is that you should build that. 
and now you'll have a solution. And so then when you say, why do we have this piece of shit UID system, you can say, God, because I didn't get off my ass and do it. I should have built the real private solution. That might not actually be practical, but at least you can know that there are alternative solutions to it. And so you should try to build that if you want. And if you want some paper references to show systems like this, I'd be happy to do that. You can send me an email about it. And uh, yeah, this is a ridiculously long thing. Two okay, hours we're gonna, of talking. So we're going to end here. Thank you. Uh, Thank you all for coming. Uh, this event was organized by HasGeek, Null, and uh, the Tactical Technology Collective, Kiran, Maya, and Akasha Samaya. Yeah. Uh, Jake is speaking tomorrow at a panel in the National Law School, which is in Nagarbhavi. <laughs>